your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and swarm, still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. So lift your voice, it's a year of jubilee, out of Zion's still salvation comes. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call. So lift your voice, it's a year of jubilee, out of Zion's still Brothers and sisters, as we come together for this week's message, we are still in the midst of a lockdown and a curfew. We have been staying at home for over a month and while all these restrictions have a severe impact on our life, uh, 
it's a principle of life that every good thing has a bad result and every bad thing has a good result. So that the always the ramifications of something, there's always good and always bad. Therefore, I'm seeing something good that has come out of uh, spending these one and a half months in our homes. And what is that? We have had to step back. Step back from activities, step back from involvements, step back even from spiritual, religious activities that we have been involved in our whole life. And when we step back, we have the opportunity to look at and understand what we have been doing and what we should be doing in a deeper way. And I think we'll never get a chance like this in our lifetime. To make some course correction, to really ask some relevant, pertinent questions about uh, what we are doing with our life and how we should be handling it. And I think that that's one of the positives we can take from the curfew and the lockdown. So, what I would like to, to speak to you about is the salvation of Jesus Christ. You know that uh, we have been told from our small days, you know, that Jesus saves, you know. So, of course, there is this uh, joke about Jesus saves, you know, that there was this competition between Satan and Jesus on to see who was more powerful, you know. And then they were both given computers, you know, and uh, they, they were told to cut and paste and write and all. It was a, it was a electronic competition. And suddenly the power went and Satan uttered the most terrible profanities because he lost all his work. But Jesus was very calm. You know. So they asked him, how is that? Because then he said, Jesus saves. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so you can see, <laughs> you know, uh, so you can see uh, uh, the meaning of Jesus saves. You know, we can have a lot of meanings. But what does it mean? Uh, as I understand it, uh, Jesus frees us, liberates us in two ways. Number one, he calls us and he says, I'll free you of the things that afflict you. I will free you. Jesus saves. So one of the most beautiful things, uh, examples of that I can take from Mark chapter 3, verse 8. Mark chapter 3, verse 8. When they heard all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. So you can see, lot of people came to Jesus because he was freeing them from their ailments, healing the sick, uh, exorcising the demons, even raising the dead, feeding the hungry. So because of that, lot of people came to Jesus and he ministered to them. In one part of the gospel it is said that he healed all who came to him. So verse 9 if you look at it uh, you, can, you can see it expressed. Because of the crowd he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him. To keep the people from crowding him. And verse 10, you know, it goes along with it, verse 10. For he had healed many, 
so that those those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him so you can see jesus saves and many people crowded and rushed to jesus to be liberated saved healed their problems to be solved by him and we can say even today uh, is the same thing is true wherever people hear that there are miracles taking place healings taking place that divine interventions are taking place what happens is people come they don't really uh, are they are not too much concerned who is doing it whether they have the proper authority whether they have been accepted or not by people people come because people want this part of their life met and uh, this is a wake up call for us to especially when we speak and minister in the name of jesus if we don't provide this part of ministry they will go somewhere else to get that met and then of course we blame people and say you know their faith is not deep they are not really being faithful but jesus met these needs clearly and verse 11 uh, explains it even further whenever the evil spirits saw him they fell down before him and cried out you are the son of god so you can see he had a powerful ministry and everyone has a right to experience that saving from jesus but what i want to tell you today is that this is 50% of his ministry but there was another 50% he saved people in another way and what is that way that's called discipleship he said come follow me and we need to understand that my brothers and sisters say a person has a has a cirrhosis and the cause of the cirrhosis is uh, drinking you know so this person comes to jesus he comes to a healing service comes to a ministry and this person receives a healing of his liver but then the person goes back home and starts drinking again that person was never saved he was given a temporary solution when his liver was healed to be saved the way we live needs to be changed to find happiness the way we the where we seek happiness needs to change to be satisfied and fulfilled we need to discover the purpose of our life for what were we created for what do we exist on the planet what is the purpose of our life we need to find this out just coming to jesus asking him to heal us asking him to solve our financial problem while going back and handling cash the way we always did that got us into the problem in the first place is not a salvation it's only a temporary solution that's why jesus offers us a a twin solution to our life first he saves us from the immediate problem we have and then he says if you want true freedom come follow me praise the lord praise the lord praise the lord and we need to understand this we need to be clear about this So Matthew chapter 4 verse 18 you can see it As Jesus was walking beside the sea of Galilee he saw two brothers Simon called Peter 
and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake. For they were fishermen. 419. Come follow me, Jesus said. And I will make you fishers of men. Can you see? Two parts to being saved. Number one, immediately he meets our need. You know, he doesn't say, okay, I'll give you an answer in ten years. He meets our need immediately. And then he says, do you want to find the, the true freedom of your life, the true purpose, the true fulfillment? Then he says, come follow me. My brother, my sister, this following of Jesus is for every single Christian. The Second Vatican Council was so clear. The Vatican Council said, every baptized Christian is called to be a disciple. And therefore, you are called to, be, to receive help from the Lord, and we, you and I are called to follow him as the answer to the deepest needs of our life. And not only as a deep answer to our need, as the way to find happiness, fulfillment, completion of our lives, we need to become disciples of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So how do we follow him? So as I understand it, just like there are two ways of being saved, there are two ways of following Jesus. One is called internally following Jesus. That is following Jesus in the secret place of your heart. Second is called externally following Jesus. Internally following Jesus, externally following Jesus. So for internally following Jesus, it will be John chapter 14, verse 20. John 14, 20 is a beautiful verse that really brings such an insight into our hearts. On that day, you will realize I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Can you see that? You will, it's a journey of realization. As we go through the spiritual walk and the journey, uh, something opens up inside of us and a realization begins to dawn that God, the Father and Jesus are having an intimate living relationship with me. And that relationship is taking place deep within our own hearts. And as I was reflecting this morning in the morning readings of the Mass, you know, which we are doing for the Easter reflection. Jesus, the difference between Jesus and the Jews of his time were that Jesus was having a direct communion with the Father. And he was hearing him, knowing him, and following him on the earth in his time. The problem with all the devout Jews of that time were, they were following a system. They were following a tradition. They were following an interpretation of the law in, their, in what they thought that they were following God. And no wonder they were in conflict. <laughs> Jesus said, those who... Those who are mine, they hear my voice. They know me. And I was just reflecting this morning. Could the same thing have happened to us? What happened to the Jews of the time of Jesus? Because now it's 2,000 years. We also have a rich tradition. We also have a system. We have a hierarchical process. We have an entire thing built up. And from our birth to our death, we are inside this system. 
and even of who we are is given to us by this system. You are a lay person. You are a, a reverend sister. You are a priest. You are a bishop. And each one is given a, a value, attributed a worth. And according to that, we find meaning to our lives. That's fine because that's a function, that's a call. But then the Lord says, you have to glow deeper. Not just follow, not just accept a title as your identity. Not just accept a position as who you are. But you go deeper into an intimate relationship with God. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. I love you. This touch is to experience the heart of Jesus. Every liturgy is organized for people to touch that heart. Every devotion was originally meant to touch that heart. Every spiritual exercise was meant to touch that heart. And it did. But over time, people become caught up in the system, in the world, so much so that that becomes reality. And we lose the sight and the voice of Jesus. And that's why today we have been re-invited. Discipleship means walking intimately with Jesus and the Father in your heart. Truly satisfying Him. Truly being pleasing to Him. Allowing your conscience to be measured by Him. And allowing Him to give us the value that we really need. And that's why even today's morning reading was so beautiful because uh, we spoke about Barnabas, you know. Barnabas, who is always mentioned second or third or fourth. First comes Peter or then comes Saul. You know. But when you look closely, the ministry of Barnabas, not too valued in human form, but invaluable in the eyes of God. My brother, my sister, the first one is so important. And if we have lost it, this one and a half months of stepping back can be of real help. Why is that? Rediscover this internal revelation from your God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The external ministry. John 20, verse 21. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Can you see? One, we are called to the internal experience of Jesus. Second, we are called to do his ministry in the world. If you ask me, that's the purpose of every Christian's life. You may be doing it as a, as a doctor. You may be doing it as a, as a lawyer. You may be doing it as a businessman. But... Internally walking into the heart of God, externally carrying out His mission in the world. And verse 22 uh, completes it. And with that, you can repeat that. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So John is very clear, you know. The Holy Spirit is there to do these two things. Number one, lead us deeper and deeper into the intimate relationship of the Holy Trinity. Pleasing God, being faithful to Him, walking in His Spirit becomes more important than anything else. And then the Holy, baptism of the Holy Spirit gives something else, carrying the very mission of Jesus into the world. Next week I'll talk about that. But this week, I want to talk to you about 
following Jesus from within. Because that's what we are doing at home. You know, some people are going crazy. You know, I don't know what to do, they say. You know, we're looking at the same faces, you know. And, you know, sometimes I'm thinking, if a couple were fighting, you know, and they escaped the fight by going to work, you know, they only saw each other in the night, you know. And, and now they are forced to be locked down together, you know. You can, you can imagine, you can imagine the fury, the, the volcanoes, the mountains that must be moving inside, you know. But I'm telling you, you can turn this into a great opportunity. Find the Lord who can build that unity. Find the Lord who can heal your, your strife. Find the Lord who will turn this into a blessing. For that, because we can't minister outside, let's do the first leg, journeying within. Journeying within. Let's learn it. And tonight, that I would like to offer you Three knowings walking in the heart. John 14, 20, I told you, you know, that day you will know that the Father is in me and I am in you. We also need to know three things. Number one, if you are writing down, knowing your center. Know what your center is. What is the center of your life? Know it. Knowing your center. Number two, knowing that you are a sinner. That doesn't seem very inspiring. <laughs> but anyway, let me tell you that that's one of the most powerful things you can know. Knowing that you are a sinner. And the third knowing, knowing that your life is not about you. Or let's say, your life is not all about you. Your life is not all about you. So the third one actually I will continue into next week. You know, looking at the ministry of Jesus and discovering our own purpose and meaning to our life. But today I want to deal with the first two. Knowing your center and knowing that you are a sinner. When you follow Jesus. So Luke chapter 5. I'm going to go with the call of, call of Peter in Luke chapter 5. And we are going to start, go work from there. So you can do it after. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genazareth, with the people crowding around him, and listening to the word of God. You know, a lot of people are confused how many lakes Jesus visited in his lifetime. You know. <laughs> so he has the Sea of Galilee he goes to, and then he goes now to the Lake of Genazareth, and then he goes to where he meets the uh, disciples after the resurrection. Uh, where is it you call it? the Sea of Tiberias, they call it, you know. So how many lakes, you know, it must be a, a land full of rivers and lakes. You know. But actually it's a desert with only one lake. And that lake is called so many names. Why is that? Because four kingdoms surrounded this, uh, this uh, water uh, area. The four sons of Herod the Great were ruling in four different areas. So whenever you went to one place, uh, you, that place was named according to the kingdom there. So he crossed from Genazareth into another, another kingdom. So it was the kingdom of Genazareth that he were, people were listening to the word of God. 5.2 He saw at the water's edge That's not that. Batar Mullavat. <laughs> Someone here thought that. That's a <laughs> Two boats <laughs> left there by the fishermen <laughs> who were washing their nets. Verse 3. He got into one of the boats 
the one belonging to Simon and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So my brothers and sisters, Jesus had already entered the boat of Simon. And we can say the same thing about our own lives. Jesus has already entered your boat. Now how you deal with him is what matters. So I'm suggesting you stop calling him to come. You know, because I think that he must be getting pretty frustrated with us. Because all the time we are calling him to come. Why is that? Come Jesus, come and help. Because we are, we are having this mindset that he's not there. And then John 14, he says, I will give you a comforter to be with you forever. Who is that? The Holy Spirit. But then we start by saying, come Holy Spirit. Why is that? Because we have this perception that he's missing. Actually he's missing. But he's not missing because he's not there. He's missing because we have not dealt with him, recognized him, realized he's there and opened our hearts to him. So today is a good way to begin by recognizing you don't have to call him. You don't have to tell him to come. He's already there. All you have to do is open your heart to him. And that's why Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart knocking. If anyone hears, I will open, I will enter. He's already in the boat. Already waiting for us. 5.4 when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. So, actually, if you remember, the, if you look at this incident through the eyes of, uh, of a profession, what was the profession of uh, Jesus? What was he? Carpenter. What was the profession of Peter? Fisherman. So a carpenter is telling the fisherman <laughs> how to do his job. <laughs> and <laughs> you're asking for trouble, you know, <laughs> because and fishermen have a wide repertoire, you know, their vocabulary is very, very developed, you know, <laughs> and he would have told him <laughs> what he thought about it, you know. But obviously when Jesus was preaching, Peter was mending his nets, you know, and uh, he would have been listening, most probably. Verse 5. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. My brothers and sisters, here is the key that we need to look at. What's the key? Jesus was a guest in the boat of Peter. So while he is a guest, nothing much happened. Then, he gives him a suggestion. Stop being in the shallows and put into the deep. Now, Peter answers with a very valuable word. What's the word? Master. What's the first thing I told you about? Can you remember? I told you the first thing is knowing your center. So why here, Peter made a significant decision. What was the decision? He shifted his center. 
And he said, Master to Jesus. So now, Peter was not the master. Jesus was the master. So the question is, who is the master of your life? And who is Jesus? You know, you don't have to call him, he's here already. But who is he? Is he a guest? Or worse, you know, is he an unwelcome visitor? You know? <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are unwelcome visitors, you know. You can't get on with your life, that guy won't go, you know. So, <laughs> so, so we make some gestures, you know. We make some... Uh, uh, some, you know, we give them a hint. They won't even take a hint. You know. So then only you have. So Jesus can be a welcome guest, an unwelcome guest. But the challenge is, if you are a disciple, you have to make him master. What does master mean? Master means what I want take second place to what you want. Master. Jesus is master. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And when he was made master, things began to happen. But what happened? He said, he explained to Jesus the problem. Jesus, we have been fishing the whole night. And there is no solution. We didn't catch anything. And it can be the same with us. Lord, we have been trying our whole life. But we didn't really have an answer to the need of our hearts. We really don't have an answer to our addiction. We don't have an answer to our fighting. We don't have an answer to our, to our inner, innermost uh, 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 unhappiness. We don't have an answer to our depression. An answer to our sadness. We have tried everything. We have no answer. And then Jesus says, put out into the deep. Leave the shallows. And I want to explain what the shallows are. The shallows is the answers that you and I have devised for our lives. We won't go beyond that. We won't leave that place, shallows. This is all I will do. This is all that, that it will happen. This is all. I will not go beyond this. Shallows. A person I know. Having great qualities. Always doing the right thing. But something I suddenly realized about this person. I have never ever heard that person say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, forgive me. I suddenly realized, I never heard it. And then I realized, when I spoke with that person, I said, it's, I'm afraid to leave the shallows. If I say, for, I'm sorry, I don't know what will happen to me. You know, my safety net will be broken. My security will be gone. If I say, forgive me, I don't know what, will, what kind of reaction I will get. So therefore, I protect myself. I'm in the shallows. I defend my, what I have done. I'm in the shallows. Jesus said, leave the shallows and put into the deep. What is the deep? Deep is the unknown. Obey me, master. Obey me and put out into the unknown. Obey my direction. Take a risk. And he says, then I will lead you from that place. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I'm talking about, you can talk about this for about many things. But today, I'm talking to you about this concerning our relationships. Because we are stuck at home, you know. <laughs> and we are dealing with people, you know. And we are handling our shallows, you know. 
and we are we are we are want to be keep the safety nets on you know and we don't want to take a risk of obeying jesus and getting into the deep i don't know whether i'll lose lose my security lose my happiness lose my joy and here's the challenge put out into the deep follow me can you see now we are not following jesus by going from one one place to another place but we are following jesus by following his command in dealing with the people around us praise the lord praise the lord praise the lord you can see the see the beauty put it into the put it into the deep he is the center of your life see what happened when he put put into the deep you know so beautiful verse 6 when they had done so they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break 57 so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink you know bishop robert baron says uh, peter one step into the deep fed the whole village one step into the deep fed the whole village and that's exactly what took place here one step into the deep so many other people are nourished by that one step center jesus at the center of it all we sing he's at the center we follow his command and the wheel of life turns around it my brother my sister it's a it's another way what does it mean when we have ourselves at the center we have a very troubled life why is that when we are successful we are on top but the wheel of life turns and when we are failures we are down when we are strong we feel like kings when we become weak we become depressed because when we are at the center we are spinning with the wheel that's why life is so tiresome for people one day up next day down one day great next day next day rejected and because we have kept ourselves at the center we have to face up to all the changes of life that constantly come but the beautiful thing is when you make jesus the center you are only an observer of what happens in your life st ignatius the great founder of the jesuits he said this prayer no he said take all myself my liberty take it all and then he said what you give me as you take it all really doesn't matter whether this moment is rejection or whether this moment is fame it doesn't really matter i take it from your hands whether this moment is acceptance or whether this moment is judgment it doesn't really matter i take it from your hands you are at the center praise the lord praise the lord praise the lord 
at the center is absolute stillness and peace. That's why Jesus said, John 14, he said, I give you my peace. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives it to you. Isn't it beautiful? What's the peace of the world? When everything is under control, I'm having peace. But when Jesus is at the center, in the eye of the storm, is absolute peace. Because he is at the center. Knowing your center. Taking everything from his hands. Moving through life. Taking the good and the bad because you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Put out into the deep. Surely it will be a blessing. So it's a good time when we are praying. You know, we are in our homes when we are praying. Pray into the center. We have another word for it in the charismatic renewal. We call it the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Same thing. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. He, Jesus is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, Father Cantalamesa, who, who uh, even this, this uh, Good Friday, he preached in the, in the Vatican. He preached to the Pope. You know, every Good Friday for the last so many years, he's been preaching. He's been preaching to three popes. And uh, when they asked him, where is it that there was a shift in your life? He said, in Kansas City, in 1977, you know, when there was this great gathering of the charismatic renewal. And on the board came the words, Jesus Christ is Lord. He said, everything in my life shifted. He said, I, I was a priest then. But it shifted. It took on a different meaning. He became the center. And for us also, if he's at the center, you can take misunderstanding. It's only a, a, a turn of the wheel. It will come around. You, know. you can take rejection. It's only another turn of the wheel. It will come around. Because he is at the center. And then there is this beautiful story. You know, of the, you know there was these desert monks, you know, in the third century, in uh, the evolution of Christianity, the third century saw people seeking the authentic experience of Jesus. And seeking that, they went into the Egyptian desert. And they spent their entire lives in meditation, seeking, uh, seeking uh, uh, the, uh, intimacy with, uh, with Jesus. And here was one person, uh, one monk, uh, he and his servant, they stayed in a, they stayed on a mountain and they made baskets while they were meditating. They went to the village and sold the baskets and uh, then they made, got the money to buy provisions and went back to meditation. And one day uh, a girl in the village was uh, found to be pregnant. And they beat her and said, who is the father, you know? And then he, she said, it's the monk. Uh, on that mountain. They were furious. They came up the mountain, dragged the monk down, thrashed him, dragged him along the street. He never said a word. You know, and said, you have to look after this woman, you dirty man. So he went back to the mountain and he told the assistant, or the guy who was helping him, we have to make more baskets. Why? Because we have another mouth to feed now. And that's what they did. And then when the girl was about to give birth, she felt so bad. She said, actually, it is not this man who is the father. It is a young man in the village. Everyone was repentant. They went to him and said, why didn't you tell us? He said, I take the good and the bad from the hands of God. It's a beautiful story of internal rest. Accusations didn't move him, neither did freedom. 
or acquitted. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Having Jesus at the center. My brothers and sisters, with him at the center, we have the second thing taking place. Knowing that you are a sinner. Let's look at it. Verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. You know, it looks a pretty strange uh, response to a catch of fish. You know? <laughs> Suddenly, you get this huge catch of fish, and instead of saying, wow, you know, wow, blessed, we got it, you know, we made it, hooray, eureka, you know, we, <laughs> we've got it all. The reaction was very strange. What was the reaction? He said, Lord, go away from me. I'm a sinful man. Peter saw himself for the first time maybe. Not from his own understanding, but he saw himself through the light of Jesus Christ. The personality of Jesus Christ as he stood in the boat or sat in the boat began to shed a light into the life of Peter and he saw that in the light of this man I am a fraud. In the light of this man I am an egoistic person. In the light of this man I have been doing nonsense. Suddenly, he realized his limitations. My brother, my sister, often it's the opposite in our own lives. Why is that? Normally, we are full of who we are. Our talents, our gifts, our goodness. And we can see the weakness of other people. You know, give us anybody and we'll tear them apart. We will expose uh, hidden motives in them, you know. We will expose their sinfulness. But in our own hearts, it's hidden. Till the light comes in. One of the great signs of being a saint, it is said in the spiritual tradition is, when a person is aware of their sinfulness, not in a destructive way, not in a negative way, but in a life-transforming way. It is said that St. Francis of Assisi, as far as I know, the person who has had an impact on Christianity next to Jesus Christ is uh, St. Francis of Assisi. You know. and it's, it's such an impact on the church, you know. a man raised by God. Uh, it is said by one of his companions who wrote this book that he spent a whole night in prayer and he shivered and when they asked him why you he says it's because I'm aware of my sinfulness so some people thought it's vanity you know how can you be so sinful you know the little flower they said you know little flower always used to say I'm a real sinner I'm a real sinner and then people used to say you know she's pretending you know what kind of sin can she do but the real problem was not that they were sinners in that sense. What was happening is they were living in the light of God. And when you are exposed to the light, all the flaws are seen. And that is to bring to the feet of Jesus. That's where saintliness comes in. You know, I understood this beautifully a few days ago, you know. Uh, uh, I do the morning meetings and the night meetings from my, my uh, studio upstairs, you know. And in the morning that day, uh, I had finished the morning meeting and the monitors looked quite okay, you know. Then one of the cur curtains shifted a little bit, you know. And the ray of the direct sun 
hit the monitor, you know. My God, that dust. <laughs> then only I saw, with the lights of the studio, you can't see it. <laughs> you hit, the, hit it with the sunlight, all the specks of dust. Then only you realize, then only I realize, isn't that what happened to the saints, you know. The inner being was exposed, not to condemn, not to reject, but to be transformed in that light. That's what God wants. Know that you are a sinner. And when you know that you have been loved and transformed by the grace of God, you become a refuge for so many others who need the touch of God in their life. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And then finally, know that your life is not all about you. Actually, I don't have much time. Next week I'm going to build this. Know that your life is not all about you. To understand this, we have to understand the beautiful life of Jesus Christ. And I found this amazing passage in the letter to the Hebrews. And I want to share that with you today. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. You know, Hebrews is tough, you know. Uh, because it's all, all kinds of structured thinking, you know. But it's amazing if you can pierce it through, you know. The author explains it this way. But we see Jesus, we can live with that. Who was made a little lower than angels. Now crowned with glory and honor. Because he suffered death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. <laughs> I told you Hebrews is tough. You know. But, but let, me, let me put this together. God asked Jesus, who is his only son, to become a little lower than angels. And then he asks him to suffer death so that everyone may be saved from death. I'm saying that again. God asks his loving son to become a little lower than angels so that he and to suffer death so that he could save everyone from death. Mission. I want you to look at the mission of Jesus Christ and look at it carefully. My brothers and sisters, God loved Jesus. There is no two words about that. On the, on the, on the, uh, in the Jordan, you hear the voice, this is my beloved son. I love him. In a deep, intimate love. Again on the Mount of Transfiguration, here is my son who I am well pleased with. Listen to him, you know. It's like a proud father saying, listen to my son, you know, how, how beautiful he is. And then again in John 12, he says, I glorify, father glorify my name. And the voice from heaven says, I glorify it. I glorify it again. Jesus was deeply loved by the father. How deeply loved? He was now crowned with glory. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is resurrected. He is glorified. And he is the Lord of the universe. Now seated at the right hand of God. But in between these two, from coming to the earth and returning to glory, God said, I have a mission for you. What's the mission? Like I love you, the Father said. I love everyone on the, in the world. I would like them also to sit in our family table, at our family table, to be members of our family. 
Yes, Father. I also would like that. Then would you suffer that they be they brought to the family of God? And Jesus says, yes, Father. I'll suffer that the world may be blessed. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Then only you begin to understand the meaning of suffering. The meaning of going through pain. On one hand, loved. On the other hand, mission. And we are all called to the same thing. Maybe we never fully realize this. Beautifully given. Your life is not all about you. It's about a purpose God has. He's about you as well because he wants to take you to the, to the throne room and sit with you in, at his table. But on the way, he says, I have a few jobs for you. And that job transforms. Verse 10, you look at this beautiful text. In bringing many sons to glory. You can repeat that. Can you see that? He's on the way. He's bringing many sons to glory. It was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the author of their salvation Perfect through suffering. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? The glory of Jesus is made perfect through the suffering he has to save human beings and bring them to the Father. You know, the Lord is showing me, you know, you have to see your life not inside the context of your little world. This life is not just all about you. In the same way, the Lord Father is telling us, I'm, I'm giving you the guarantee you will sit with me in heaven. On the way, you'll be made perfect by the suffering you'll undergo in doing my mission on earth. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Look at the verse 11. We'll finish with that. Verse 11, both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. Can you see that? We are into the family of God. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. It's not about you, my brother, my sister. It's not about this little world here. It's about this massive work of God. You and I are part of it. Our suffering contributes to it. Our rejection contributes to it. Our pain contributes to it. We have been perfected to share in the family of Jesus himself. So we just praise and thank the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory to your name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Praise the Father. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory to you, Lord. Praise the Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Father. We glory to your name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to you, Lord. Praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus.
from beginning to the end it will always be it's always been you jesus jesus nothing else matters nothing in this world will do oh, oh, oh. jesus you're light and that mirror into our hearts and I don't know about you but I feel even though I have made Jesus and even though I have said Jesus is the center of my life I feel I have been at the center and even Jesus had been someone that I would like to make use of as a crutch as a support as a way to solve my need and my problem. Lord Jesus, that was my brokenness. I couldn't keep you at the center. And even when we do ministry, though we say we serve you, many times it was about our own value, appreciation, the fulfillment that we receive from doing your work. Lord, if somebody had asked me whether I had those motives, I would have rejected it and said no. No, I'm not like that. But the negatives that happen in my life show it is so. I cannot take a criticism. I fall away. I cannot take pain. I try to avoid it. I cannot handle the judgment of others I feel I need to abandon the work then only I realize it is revealing the deep hidden love of self that you are not at the center things are affecting me Lord Jesus tonight I want to offer you my heart I want you to be the center and really what happens to me and around me doesn't really matter as long as you say you are my beloved son you are my beloved daughter I'm pleased with you that I will take whatever comes from your hands and enjoy coming into the heart thank you Lord hallelujah 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 
achievements will not give us the meaning that we wanted. And pain will destroy us. And pain will destroy us. And it will bring sadness into our lives. And it will bring sadness into our lives. But when you are at the center, our joy comes not from success our joy comes not from success but from having you but from having you at the heart of our lives at the heart of our lives our fulfillment comes our fulfillment comes not from achieving in the world not from achieving in the world but being beloved son and daughter to the father but by being beloved son and daughter to the father pain gives us more motivation Rejection brings us greater strength. Rejection brings us greater strength. And our lives are used by you. And our lives are used by you to be a blessing for the whole world. To be a blessing for the whole world. Here we are, Lord. Use us, Lord. Move in us, Lord. Take us into the purpose that you have created for each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worship you, Father. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to your name. Hallelujah. 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 Praise you, Father. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. From my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Yes, it's all about you. From my heart to the heavens, Jesus be the center. It's all about you. Praise the Lord. 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 Praise the